There we go. <laughs> I'm glad to see it because that means that some young men have been uh, up here, obviously, and I love to see that. So glad to be here. And uh, sorry about playing Ring Around the Rosie with you, Jay. <laughs> You bow with me in prayer. Almighty God, our gracious Father in heaven, how great and holy is your name. We humble ourselves before you, Father. We, we bow before you, recognizing you as our creator, recognizing you as the one true and living God, Almighty Jehovah, but also so very thankful that we can call you Father. I know that you look upon us as your children, and you love us, and you care for us, and you guide us, and you bless us, and you chastise us as a father who loves his children to bring us closer to you. We pray, Father, that as we give ourselves to the study of your word, you will reveal yourself through your word that we may come to know you better, that we may serve you better, that we may draw closer to you and bring others to you. Thank you so much, Father, for the fellowship that we have in Christ. Thank you so much for his precious sacrifice for us. We're thankful that we have this opportunity to work in this community as a family of God. Pray that you will bless our efforts as we strive together to glorify you, to teach others of your word, and to shine as lights that reflect your light. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Mark 16, 15 and 16, you know well. <clears throat> Call it the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. We call that the Great Commission because it embodies the charge that our Lord has given to us. Not only a charge, but an understanding of the weight of that charge. That we have a stewardship of the precious saving power of God's word in our hands. If we sing the song, into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message guiding the airy back to the light. And so, if you have your Bible with you, and, and I certainly hope that you do, and if you have your Bible with you, I'd like for you to do something for a moment. Just pick it up, would you? And if you didn't, if there's one in the pew there, that's fine too. Just pick that up and hold it. I'm going to ask you to raise it up and say it. I just want you to hold it. I want you to think about what you're holding. We're so blessed. There are third world countries where we take Bibles and people will line up, hundreds of people lining up, waiting all day just to receive a copy. Hold it in your hand and realize what it is. God has spoken to you. He's written his word to you. He's written his desires to you. He loves you. And he's purchased you with the blood of Christ if you're his child. He's purchased you with the blood of Christ, with the ultimate sacrifice of his son. And then he said, <clears throat> now, my child, go tell others. It's easy for us to take this for granted, but this is who we are. This is our life. Everything about our life should center around this message. Now, I know some people, <clears throat> some people might 
differ with that. Recently, I heard a preacher, a gospel preacher, and uh, first thing that he said as he began class was he said, he said, uh, I don't love the Bible. And as you can imagine, that kind of floored me. And when I say gospel preacher, incidentally, I mean a preacher within churches of Christ. He said, I don't love the Bible. I love the God who gave us the Bible. Now, I appreciate the sentiment of, of saying, I love God, and I'm thankful he gave us the Bible. But I'm, I'm here to say today, and I want to say this very plainly and very boldly, I love the Bible. Because I could not know God. I would not know who God is without the Bible. I wouldn't know how to worship God without the Bible. This is my pathway to God. And this is the instrument with which God has charged you and has charged me to bring others to Him. I love this book. And I know you do too. We have a commission to go into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. There is power in the preaching of the gospel. And, and you know, sometimes I, there's, a, there, there's an effort to become more relational to a media-saturated society by getting away from preaching and spending more time in drama and things of that nature. Paul says that it's the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen. And when he says foolishness, he doesn't mean that it's foolish. He just means that some people see it as foolish. And here at the Bowling Springs Church of Christ, we don't see the preaching, the teaching, and the study of God's Word as foolish, do we? And it's precious. Jesus said, All power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. And you're probably going to get tired of hearing me say this, but you're going to hear it a lot as we study through the scriptures. Anytime you see the word therefore, Stop to see what it's there for. Huh? It's there for a reason. When, when we see the word therefore, that means that what follows the, the, the word therefore is directly related to and is a result of what came before it. So in this case, Jesus says, you can go, why? Why? In, in, in Matthew 28, in, in that Great Commission, verses 18 through 20, as we find it there, why is it that Jesus says you can go as related by that word, therefore? Somebody tell me. He has the power. And somebody says, well, you know, I just don't know if, if I have what it takes. You know, it really doesn't matter whether or not I have what it takes. I'm not going on my power. The gospel, any, any of us can open the Bible and point people to scriptures, right? And, and hopefully we have enough of a knowledge. If you knew what to do to become a child of God, if you knew what was needed to do to obey God's plan of salvation, did you already know enough to share that message from God's word with somebody else? All you have to do is help them find it in the Bible. It's the power of God's word. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's his. So all we have to do is just start showing people. And it's amazing. And some of you, I know some of you have been involved in this, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. It is amazing when you sit down with someone and you open the Bible with them and you show them the truth of God's word on such matters as the necessity of being baptized for the remission of sins, and they'll say, turn to 1 Peter 3, 21, and you say, the light figure we're into, baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. 
and they'll say, I've never seen that before. Or you go over to James chapter 2, verse 24, and they've been taught all their life that you're saved by faith only, and they open it up and you say, see that, so then we are justified by works and not by faith only. And they say, nobody's ever shown that to me before. And then I've had people look up with tears in their eyes and say, why hasn't anybody ever told me this? And all you did was show them what God said. And so if you wonder, if you have the power to fulfill the Great Commission, you do if and only if your power is in Jesus Christ. It's a matter of taking the word. And you know what's the best thing that we can do? And it's something that I try to accomplish as a gospel preacher. You know, and, and, and it is to me, to me, this is the most important thing to remember as a preacher. Don't get in the way of the word. Okay? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the message. When the preacher gets in the way of the word, the preacher starts preaching his own perspective or his own opinion, uh, opinions or, or, you know, spending half the pulpit time telling stories, you know, which are entertaining to hear, but the word isn't preached, the word isn't presented, then we, we, we haven't succeeded. We've only succeeded if God's message has been related. You can do that. Any of us can do that. And so when we think of the Great Commission and I hope that this will empower us because we have a, a mission. And we talked about this the last time I was here, that we have a mission out here, Bowling Springs Community, Spartanburg County, surrounding counties. We have a mission here. And we, and I'm not ashamed to say this, and I don't think it's being boastful at all. I believe it's based on the Word of God. We are God's lighthouse we are, we are a, a place, a people, a community that has been brought together to shine the light of God's word out. Didn't Jesus say that? Over in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13, when he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, King James Version, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and place it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light to all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I, I want to encourage you not to hide your good works. Now that may be directly opposite of what maybe you've, you've heard people say before. You know, Jesus did say, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And, 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 and he said, you know, when you pray, go to your closet. There is, a, there is an aspect there where everything must be done in humility. And he's talking about motive in, in, in that passage. He's talking about motive. Our motive must always to be to let God's light shine, not ours. If you're trying to let my light shine, then I've messed up. But if God can be glorified through the works that you are doing, then be sure that you're letting him be glorified. Let people see God working in your life. And then they'll say, I want some of that. I want some of that. I want, I want what that person has. I want, I want what can allow someone to be going through a hard time, to be struggling with cancer, or financial catastrophe, or whatever it might be, and still be able to glorify God. I want that shine. I want to shine with that light. What are your thoughts on how? So we understand that, that we have been commissioned by Christ. But now, how do we go about doing that? Either as an individual in our personal lives or as a congregation. Let's talk about that. How, how do we do that? The 
See, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that you added that last part because I was really thinking what you were saying was your heart has to be in the right place so that it's the, the result is God being glorified, not you. But you went even farther than that and you said to even have the desire to do it, the heart has to be in the right place. I think that's very insightful. It is, it's, 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 for example, okay, going back to the Great Commission, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. Have you really felt the weight of that passage? I understand what it's saying. And, and so when I go out into the community and I see people and I'm dealing with people, I'm working with people, playing with people, whatever it may be, I'm associating with people in my life, does it sadden me? Do I have an intense love for the gospel, an intense love for souls? And it saddens me to know that the people that I love do not know the Lord and do not have a surety of salvation. So we get calloused, don't we? And, and we get kind of careless with that easily. And so having our heart in the right place is definitely where it's what else? And I'm glad you said take the opportunity because sometimes we pray for opportunities, but God gives them to us every day, doesn't he? It's just a matter of faith. We're not, we don't have any shortage of opportunities, do we? Not as long as we're associating with people. You know, uh, you, you bring us to that next level as we think about this. As, as there's having the heart, having the desire, looking for it, seizing the opportunities, then there's having the courage to do it. There are hindrances, okay? Probably very few of us, if any of us, feel like we evangelize as we ought to, okay? And I'm in that category, okay? I, I see my shortcomings there, the missed opportunities. So then I, I need to ask myself a question, why? What am I afraid of? Fear is so crippling. Fear of the other day, um, somebody was, was talking about it, maybe may been Stacy, I don't remember, somebody was talking about a, uh, a, a deer was that was that TJ somebody anyway I was talking to somebody and and, and they were talking about uh, a, a doe that had come out on the highway and uh, scrambled up some rocks and then a fawn followed her and that fawn couldn't go up the rocks and so it froze right in the middle of the highway just frozen with fear and and just lay down right there in front of their vehicle and they had to stop and there's this fawn sitting there in, in the highway, just afraid. And so it just froze and it stopped and it wouldn't go anywhere. 
And the mother came back, got it, and walked off the road with it. Now I think that there's, there's a lesson there for us, a, a, just exactly what fear does to us. Fear cripples us. Now, and a lot of times we make decisions, and, and follow, follow me with this, because this is really important. I believe this, when we understand this concept, it's a game changer. This is a game changer in your life. It is a game changer in, in the way that we operate as the Lord's church. We so often make decisions based on fear. We don't see it that way. Okay? But for example, there's an opportunity and I what if myself out of, that, out of that opportunity? What have I done? I have made a decision based on fear. I'm looking at the possible negative consequences and I'm afraid of them and so I make the wrong decision. What if instead of evaluating the possible negative consequences and making a decision based on fear, what if I had faith and I made a decision based on faith and I said, this isn't my choice. This is God's opportunity I'm his vessel, I have an opportunity, I can do good, I need to do good for God, I will let God deal with the consequences. And if I must suffer as a result of doing right, then that's all the more opportunity to praise God and to glorify God, because I can glorify God the most when I'm suffering for him. And so either way, it is a win-win situation. It's a win-win when we operate out of faith. I believe that. And we, you know, and, and sometimes it's a matter of, of you know, look at the, you know, first thing we want to do is uh, look at budget or, or look at consequences or look at this, look at that. And all those things are important and they all need to be considered. Don't get me wrong. We need to make wise decisions. But we need to be sure that our decisions are based on faith, not fear. And again, I'll say this again, I don't want to uh, just, just keep beating this, but I just, I, you wouldn't believe how many people I've told about this. <laughs> I think the example of the Hispanic work here in this congregation is a great example of that. I believe that this congregation has shown that it will act out of faith, not fear, and that is exactly why, a major reason why, my family chose to come here. Because we see faith in this congregation. We see faith in this leadership. And there's, there's potential, yes. But potential is useless if we don't have the faith to seize the opportunity. So the potential, God's opportunity mixed with our faith and his power to work is amazing and can produce amazing Result to his glory. Joe. So glad you said that. You know, one of the things when when we're looking out taking taking the gospel to the America, avoid arguments. Avoid arguing for the sake of arguing. And some people are going to try that. And, and, I, and I tell you what, you're going to hear it. Okay, if you get out there and, and you evangelize and you start spreading the gospel, you're going to hear people okay, get offensive and say, "Well, do you think I'm going to hell?" You know what the answer to that is? I'm not your judge. God is. But here's what God said. Here's 
like Joe said, you take it back to the Bible, you don't argue, you use God's word. Uh, arguing about things, instrumental music, what have you, it's useless. It's useless in a situation where what someone needs to understand first is their need of God's salvation and his power to save their soul if they will obey him. And then other things can fall in place. That puts things in perspective. Anything else before we move on? Yeah. And you know what? There was a time, did Jesus not say there comes a time to shake the dust off the feet? All right. Now, he's talking about that, and we misuse that passage a lot. Uh, and we need to be very careful. A lot of times we use that as an excuse. But I, I, would also, I would also suggest this, that as long as there is life, as long as there is life, there is hope. Um, I recently shared with you a personal experience in my family that demonstrates that. After 30 years, there's hope. Okay. And so I don't, believe, I, I, I don't believe we ever really give up on people. Okay. But you also can't, you can't force people to accept something they're not willing to accept. And so maybe there comes a time where you back off and you live an example and you show, continue to show them that you care and, that, and remind them occasionally that when they're ready to talk, you're ready to talk. But it can be counterproductive to try to shove the Bible down people's throat. Okay. If they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. You know, it, it, it's, it's something to remember. I, I, was, I spent nine years as a security officer. I saw a hand, I'll, I'll get to you and just say, I don't remember who it was, but um, please hold that. Um, I was a security officer for nine years in a mall. I dealt with shoplifters, I dealt with gangs, I, you know, you name it. <laughs> if it can happen in a mall, I dealt with it. And I learned something. I learned that the insults and the hatred that so many expressed toward me, especially whenever I, you know, I was stealing or something and I had to deal with them, is that it wasn't toward me. It was toward that uniform I was wearing. They didn't know me. And sometimes people, people have this preconceived idea, and it's that idea, not the person, it's that idea uh, that they don't like, that they reject. But you know something we need to remember and, and to remind people when, when they talk about, you know, Anything about, you know, the Lord's church and, and, and want to, you know, uh, maybe, you know, cast stones on it, is to remind them that this isn't our church. We didn't start this church. Right? This, this church began, you know, back in the day of Pentecost when Jesus established it. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And so all we're trying to do as is... Um, Posted on the, the Facebook page, the Bowling Springs Church of Christ Facebook page, Striving for New Testament Christianity. It's just try to help people understand that we are just trying to be what you find in the New Testament because we know that that identifies the Lord's church. And, and then that, see what that does? That takes it away from this me and you insult exchange to... Why don't we go together to find the answer in the Bible? Because Jesus said he would build his church. Who had a hand up?
Well said. Thank you. It is indeed an obligation, and it is our obligation because we are stewards of this beautiful book that we just held in our hands and realized what God has given to us and what Christ has commissioned us. You know, our, our example is important. We lead by example. We teach by example. Now, sometimes I hear people, you know, kind of say, well, that's the way I teach is by example. Now, that, that makes something wonderful into an excuse. Uh, it, that's, not, that's not an excuse to not teach the Word of God, but Paul does write this. That's a warning bell, right? All right. Paul, Paul does write this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. And he writes, Timothy, he says, not, let no one despise your youth, but what? Be an example uh, to the believers in word and conduct in love and spirit and faith and in purity. Now, I've got to do that first, right? And, and we, we say it often, people don't care how much they know until they know how much you care. And uh, nothing hurts the Lord's church worse than the harmful influence of a hypocrite. I, all the false teaching that a person can do um, will, will not be as destructive, most likely, as hypocritical actions that the world sees. And so I, I, I've really got to be sure that I've got my life right, I've got my heart right with God, and it is a, a hard issue. So let's remind ourselves of what was spoken to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 after he uh, was the successor to Moses, after Moses' death, the Lord came to him, and he said this in Joshua chapter 1. He says, uh, he says Moses, my servant, is dead. Begin in verse 1. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all of this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Now, here's kind of the precursor to, to what we're getting at. And so God tells Joshua here, have faith in me, trust me, I'm giving you a land. And if I'm giving you the land, you will be able to take it. Now, Joshua understood that before, right? You know, when he was one of the two who came back with a good report, said, hey, we can take this land. And, and God says, I'm giving it to you. Now, God has given us a mission. God has given us a, a territory. God has said, I'm giving this to you. You go and take it for me. And so it... There's that, and then he says this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's here. Whether it be hard times that we are dealing with or overcoming our fear to do what we know is right, to stand up for what is right, then we know that God is with us. And he says, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all and according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, God's message to Joshua is as applicable today to us as it was then to Joshua. Why can we go? Because God has given us land, because Christ has the power, therefore he has commissioned us. God has given us an opportunity, a territory to take. God is with us, he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. Because of that, we can be and we must be strong and courageous. In the face of of a very formidable adversary. And listen, you can count on this. When I, a lot of times when I baptize someone, or study with them and baptize them, 
And, uh, and I tell him, so now, you know the devil's coming after you. He's had you. You were in his camp. And now you're God's. And nothing upsets the devil more than that. He's coming after you. So you be ready for it. We start when we dedicate ourselves to God's work. Be ready. There's a battle to be fought. It's not a walk in the park. It's a battle to be fought. But we can be strong and very courageous because God is with us. It is His power, not ours, and He will never forsake us. Thank you, brother. No fear in love. Love will conquer fear everything.